So, uh, yeah, thank you. I guess it's uh, probably been a bit of a long day. Um, so thank you for sticking around and coming to see me yammer on for, uh, for another 45 minutes. Uh, so I'm here to talk about how uh, the future uh, is in pieces. Now, before I talk about the future, I think it's uh, important to uh, maybe jump into the past. Uh, okay, maybe I went a little too far in my little time travel here. Um, although I, I do kind of feel like a dinosaur uh, these days. I've been doing web development since 94. Um, so, I, you know, I've, I've kind of been around. I'm, I'm, I'm old. I'm, I'm starting to fall apart. Uh, I actually had a crown pop out of my tooth yesterday, or out of my mouth yesterday. So I just, uh, but not to worry. I've got a personal trainer now. Uh, first thing she told me was to stop drinking Coke. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, let's time travel again. Um, this time, we're talking like 2002, 2003. Uh, at this point, you know, I've been doing web development for a number of years, and to me, the, around this time was actually, uh, I, it was like the heyday of web development. Uh, CSS uh, was really catching on, uh, and we were seeing uh, a huge community of bloggers uh, sharing stories. Uh, you know, we'd have things like web rings, where we'd uh, have a list of all these other places that we could go to and, and learn some really fun stuff. And, you know, having sites like A List Apart with wonderful articles talking about things like sliding door techniques and whatnot. Uh, and this was a really fun time for me. Uh, one of the sort of pivotal moments uh, during this time uh, in sort of late 2002 was uh, Wired Redesign. And when they relaunched, uh, they relaunched with a fully uh, CSS-based uh, layout. And they were one of the first large companies to actually make that step. Uh, you know, this was suddenly this point of argument that web developers around the world could go back to their boss and say, look, they did it. We can do it too. Uh, I remember Mike Davidson at ESPN uh, launching their site. And so no longer was it just like, well, yeah, you know, Wired's a tech company, it's a tech audience. But now you had ESPN with an audience of people that, you know, definitely went well beyond just the tech crowd. Uh, and so this was a really wonderful time. And, and I think about back to a lot of the, the kind of design work that I was doing. Uh, I actually kicked off my uh, freelance career in about 2004, uh, 2005. But a lot of the websites that I was doing were relatively simple. Uh, they were blog designs. And I think about all the stuff that you know, my friends were doing at the time, and they were essentially blog designs. They would have a home page and an inside page. And I think back to even the site that I had designed uh, of my own back in 2009, I was still following a lot of the same patterns that I had for about five years. You know, that I'm designing a home page, you know, and the CSS that I was writing for that was, okay, let me actually write out everything to make this page look the way I want it to. And then I would go to the inside page, and I would add on any rules that were different. So, I mean, relatively straightforward. You know, I've got a header, uh, I've got a main area, I've got comments. Uh, and for the kind of stuff that I was writing, this worked fine. For a lot of the client work that I did, it worked fine. At least I'm assuming so. I mean, for agencies, uh, and as a freelancer, I write a project, I deliver the project, and I never have to see it again. So, yeah, I mean, it could be the worst code in the world, but I never knew about it unless the client came back and said this sucked. And, you know, you know they were coming to me because I thought I was an expert and I think I had them fooled. Because uh, it, it was interesting to kind of look back at some of the code that I was writing, uh, even in 2009, and realizing, okay, well, I have, you know, this div, and you, you can see pretty much map it to this HTML that I had, where I had a comments div, and inside that was another comment div, and inside that was a div with a class of meta, and inside that was a div with a, a class of author name. You know, why was I writing this really specific CSS? Uh, considering the only thing that I actually cared about was the stuff at the end, right? I cared about what the author name looked like, and I cared about what the comment number looked like. I mean, it's a blog design. How many authors did I have on my website that I needed to be so specific with my selector? Um, so I was writing a lot of unnecessary code even back then. But again, you know, because I'm working on a blog design, you know, looking at the stats for this, 3K, gzipped. I mean, can you imagine coming in on a project now and being like the entire thing is 11K? This is our CSS. I'd have no problem working on that, right? You can pretty much fit that whole thing into a single page in your editor. 
and, and that was, you know, fantastic. And yet, when I suddenly found myself on larger projects, I realized that that approach didn't necessarily scale. Uh, because what would happen is, is, you know, I'd write all the code for one page, and then I'd move on to the next and write anything that was different. You know, it was, it was kind of like a game of Jenga, where I take a block from the bottom and I put it on top. Um, now, wow, that cat's pretty good at Jenga. <laughs> okay, so it's like this kind of Jenga, and, you know, the cat is, damn, these cats are pretty good at Jenga for some reason. <sighs> okay. Maybe a more real example. Uh, I remember the first day that uh, I started at Shopify. Um, this was uh, wow, actually pretty close to three and a half years ago. Uh, and this was their CSS uh, when I started. Um, oh, sorry, another page worth of code. Uh, that was their CSS uh, when I started. And you're like, oh, compiled CSS. Yeah, I mean, sure. No, that was, that was actually one huge CSS file, uh, uncompressed. They used SAS. Right, that of course solves everybody's problem. No, it's this was really difficult, and it did use the same process that I used for a number of years. Move on to the next page, any new CSS, throw it onto the bottom, and that kind of code base is actually quite difficult to maintain because, like, you make a change in one place, and you suddenly realize, like, I got to change things in about three other different places, and you're like, ah, screw this, I'm just gonna like try maybe rewriting all this stuff. Uh, to the point where I just kind of get fed up and say, screw it, I'm just going to get rid of it all. You know, I, I just, I kind of wanted to take this thing, you know, take all the CSS and burn it with fire. You know, just like nuke the whole project. Um, I, it, before Shopify, I had a job at Yahoo, and working there uh, was a really kind of idyllic situation in that I came in and we got to write everything from scratch. All the HTML, all the CSS, in fact, all the JavaScript, all the client-side code that we wrote was completely from scratch. And so to come in and think, you know what, okay, maybe we shouldn't necessarily take this approach of refactoring everything. Um, so if we're not gonna do that, how can we actually approach refactoring this stuff in a logical way? Uh, and the answer for that is patterns. Okay. So what do patterns really mean? Like from a design perspective, uh, we have a bunch of things on the page, right? We have these objects, but if they all looked exactly the same, uh, one, it would be pretty boring. It would also be really confusing. Like how, from a user's perspective, if all the text is the same size, if it's all the same color, if there's no hierarchy, how do you actually differentiate between the things on the page? Um, you know, this is important. Sometimes we need things to stand out uh, sometimes with position, uh, or with color, or with size, or with shape. These things are important uh, to create a hierarchy in a way for users to understand uh, the page and how to use this stuff. Unfortunately, we sometimes run into the situation where everything becomes a unique snowflake. Um, I came across this wonderful slide uh, from one of Brad Frost's talk. Uh, thankfully, he's not here, so I can steal his content. Um, but this was actually from uh, a web page, like one web page, where, you know, in this rather large page, all these different visual styles for buttons. And the thing is, is in context, a lot of this stuff makes sense. And yet, from a design perspective, and I, like when you're working at a Photoshop comp or with Sketch, because everybody uses Sketch now, right? Um, again, hopefully there's no Adobe people in the audience, I'm sorry. Um, the everything that you design uh, in a photo editor, in you know whatever app that you're using, ends up in code. Every little special snowflake is going to result in more code that you has to be written, has to be maintained, uh, and in the end can actually create a lot of confusion for users to understand. They have to basically figure out okay, what is the priority throughout an app? Can they understand what the default action is? Can they understand how to interact with things? So, you know, when we try to take this stuff and uh, actually simplify the interface, we get a lot of benefits. Uh, so one of the things we need to do is, is identify and document these patterns. 
Now, you know, talking about from the design perspective is one thing. You know, we have this thing that we're designing, usually in the context of an entire page, but what does that mean when we actually break that down? Uh, and ultimately, it means that we're mapping that thing to an HTML element. We have an HTML element on the page, and it's doing something. It has a certain purpose in life. Uh, and so we need to select that HTML element, uh, and we need to differentiate that particular HTML element from every other HTML element on the page. Uh, and to do that, we use a selector. Right? And the selector could be anything. It could be an element selector, class, ID, attribute. Uh, whatever it is that you felt like using, you, know, you have to come up with some way of identifying what that thing is and what it's doing. Uh, so what is it doing? Now, I, I thought a lot about, okay, how do we actually build a page? What are the components that we have um, on a particular page? And realizing that things, for the most part, fall into certain categories. Now, uh, I came up with five different categories. Uh, for the most part, four of them are only uh, ever really used. Uh, so at the bottom is base. Uh, pretty much everybody uses something like normalize or a CSS reset. Um, and that you're saying, you know what, an HTML element on my page, no matter where it is on the site, should look like this by default. Uh, let me just kind of set that baseline across the board. And then I'm going to layer everything on top of that. Now, again, thinking back to my process, and actually having done a fair amount of research on other people's talks and, you know, their process and how they build, uh, you know, starting from the outside and working in. And for me, that meant working on the layout recognizing that the, the layout of things where you've got a header, you've got a footer, you've got a, a main section and a sidebar, and that's a pretty common pattern that we see on a ton of websites. Uh, you might be using a grid system. Now, at this point, we haven't really talked about the actual content that is going into each of these things. It's just the structure that we know we're going to put things into. Uh, I mean, one of the talks I, I saw earlier was talking about how you know a lot of web design these days is kind of the same thing. Like, we recognize certain patterns. Yes, navigation's going to go to the top. You're going to ha have maybe some sub-navigation on the side. Uh, but it's not really going to be too much beyond that. Uh, and so we can codify those, those patterns. Um, but then once we actually get into the individual content pieces, you know, we actually talk about the articles or the comments or drop-downs or carousels and all these things that actually consist of our particular site, uh, these are the modules, right? So these are the, the visual patterns throughout our website, and we want to be able to take those things uh, and break them down into reusable chunks. Now, once we've actually done that, uh, then each of those pieces may have various states that they might live in. So, for example, for uh, a button, that it might have an active state. It might have a disabled state. Uh, if you have a an accordion view, that you have a collapsed state and you have an expanded state. Uh, you have all these different uh, states that things can live in. You can have state transitions. Uh, you know, what happens when you close a modal? Does it just disappear or does it fade or does it flip or does it slide off to one side? Uh, so we have all these different states that um, these things can exist in. Uh, and so the last one that I haven't really mentioned is theming. Uh, and theming is kind of a tough word. Like for me, theming uh, was actually very specific to the work we were doing at Yahoo in that, uh, you know, you have this design and as great as purple is, you know, it's a royal color, not everybody loves purple. Um, so we wanted people to be able to go to a little modal dialogue and just pick whatever theme they want. It could be blue, there's like one with grass on it, um, all these different types of uh, themes. But when they clicked on that, we didn't want people to download, you know, another two meg CSS file. It'd be great if they could just load in, like, maybe 1K, where they're only seeing what's changed. Um, you know, if you're only changing, in this case, uh, seven colors uh, and a background image, those are the only differences uh, when it came to theming. Uh, how can we isolate those particular things? Um, and so it was very specific to that. Um, and so when I talk about theming, I really mean... Uh, that there is a user interface change that's kind of triggered by JavaScript. Uh, pretty much 99% of the other projects that I've worked on have never needed theming in this kind of context. Yes, some, a site's going to have colors, it's going to have a look and feel, uh, but it's going to have a static look and feel. It's not going to change uh, you know, 
whenever a user wants to, it's going to have a specific look and feel. So, you know, I talked a little bit about the layout stuff. We've got a header, sidebar, and content. Um, and then we need to be able to identify that that's what this thing is. Uh, and so we start to see naming convention kind of come into play here, that I have a header, but what is it really? Well, it's a layout. It's a, a container for putting other stuff into. And so I'm going to identify that as a layout, so layout hyphen header. You know, when I have the individual modules, um, I need to be able to identify those things. I need to classify these things. So I might have tabs uh, on a page. Uh, at Yahoo, we love buttons. We had you know, the large buttons, the small buttons, the dark buttons, the search buttons. Uh, but they all started from the same base. Uh, they had the same rounded corners. Uh, they had the same uh, typeface. They had um, a lot of the, sort of this gray background, this drop shadow, all those things. We, we set that as the default. Uh, and then we needed to be able to declare those differences, those variations. Uh, so we have our sort of default button class, uh, and then we need a way of defining what those different things are. Um, and so button hyphen dark. You notice the naming convention here using the same uh, class name. So it's not just button space dark, it's button space button dark. Uh, and again, the purpose there is to make it very clear that these things are related, they belong together, that when I go to my CSS file, I'm gonna see these things together. Uh, and that's a really useful way of being able to understand where everything is, understand my project uh, in a really uh, convenient way. Now, you know, up until this point, I've talked about a specific HTML element. Like if I think about a button, it is one specific HTML element. But sometimes interfaces are a little bit more complicated than that. Um, take a modal dialog, for example. There is the modal frame. Uh, there might be the, uh, the modal mask, the, the gray uh, background uh, that kind of hides everything. There's a modal header. Uh, there's a modal body and a modal footer. And again, we need to be able to sort of identify that these child elements are related to this parent element. So the parent element is the modal, uh, but then these child elements have a naming convention that is associated with that parent element. Uh, so we have that naming convention to, to link those things together. Uh, now, in the intro, uh, I was mentioned I did happen to write a book about a lot of this stuff called Scalable and Modular Architecture for CSS, which is a bit of a mouthful, so I just call it SMACS for short. Um, and in there, I, I came up with my own naming convention because at the time, I didn't see anything else. Uh, I was unaware of anybody else doing naming convention for CSS. Uh, since that time, uh, the sort of BEM or BEM naming convention has really taken off. Um, and that's what you'll see on the right, um, which is actually kind of a variation um, on the actual BEM naming convention, uh, but it's definitely the, the most popular right now, where they use the double hyphens to indicate those variations, like the button dark, uh, you know, the button search, all those sort of different look and feels for a given element. Uh, and then they use the double underscore for child elements. Uh, I find it kind of no noisy. I mean, per personally, I prefer a little less... Uh, hyphenation uh, in my naming convention, so I tend to use a single hyphen and then a double hyphen for components, but whatever naming convention that you come up with, you're essentially recognizing that there are three different types of roles uh, that you have. You've got the, the base module, uh, then you have the variation on that module, and then you have the child elements of that module. And that's a pattern that I continue to see uh, to this day uh, with any of the other sort of CSS naming conventions and frameworks and whatnot coming out. So, you know, this breaking things down into pieces, uh, the, the sort of core thing about this is about isolation. You know, that we can take this component and describe it with a very discrete set of CSS that we're not taking a bunch of different things and mixing it together. Uh, I mean, people often like to use the Lego metaphor. Uh, in this case, we're gonna build a piece and we're just gonna keep it as its own little variation, this thing that's gonna sit by itself. Uh, and then we can take all these different pieces and build something bigger out of that. Um, as opposed to trying to you know, build one little thing out of a bunch of different pieces and then take that and combine it with a bunch of other little things made out of a bunch of little pieces. Uh, because it can actually get kind of confusing when you want to change uh, 
one thing in one place, and again, not recognizing all the sort of dependencies uh, that have grown throughout the system. And so inevitably, we kind of run into these things. Like, I have a button, and it's in a modal dialog. So I want to use uh, a selector that identifies this particular use case. You know, why can't I just do dot modal child selector dot button? That, that works. I can write that CSS, and I can go home. Uh, but what I've seen time and time again is that the moment you create one instance of something, every other designer on the project, even yourself, as you move forward, as the project evolves, are going to recognize new areas that you can use those existing patterns. So if you can use those existing patterns in other places, how can we do that from the sort of CSS perspective? Because I've already made this particular button very specific to a modal dialog, when in reality, if I want to use it somewhere else, how do I solve that problem? Well, I just add another selector, right? And I say, well, okay, I've got buttons and modals, and I have buttons in some other thing, and I'm just going to add more selectors to solve that problem. Uh, but in actuality, uh, the way to solve this problem is actually pretty straightforward. You know, if we have these variations, um, as I mentioned before, we're just going to use a naming convention and identify that this thing is a variation. Sure, right now it might only be used in one place, but it might not be that case forever. Uh, so let's not lock ourselves in based on naming convention. Okay, so now that we have this naming convention, now that we've kind of isolated these things, you know, when we start looking at the CSS that we're writing, uh, I mean, how many of you use a preprocessor? SAS, less, pretty much the whole room. Uh, which is fascinating. Three years ago when I would ask that question, like four people would raise their hand. So it's a sign of just like how quickly um, our industry has changed in the last three years. Uh, so I think, you know, a, a SAS file that looks like this is probably uh, not unusual, right? You've taken these sort of modular pieces and you've broken them down into individual chunks. Then we're just going to compile it all together in one big style sheet uh, using something like SAS. Okay, now that we've done that from the CSS perspective, you know, why are we not doing that from an HTML perspective? Um, when uh, I was at Yahoo, we actually did break our interface down into mustache templates. I really like mustache. I like the simplicity of the templating language. I like the lack of logic. Um, but, you know, if you're using Handlebars or Hogan or, you know, some other mustache-related uh, templating language, uh, in fact, you know, if you've been looking at any of the sort of uh, React uh, or Ember or Angular, like all these different frameworks, all have a templating language of some sort. Um, and so this ability to now break this down, that we've created the CSS, which is designed to style HTML. You know, as much as uh, I've certainly talked in the past about decoupling CSS from, from HTML, in reality, CSS is designed to style HTML. It will always be linked uh, intrinsically um, as a result of that. Uh, so, you know, if we're creating a button, we kind of know what our button HTML should look like. If I'm creating a carousel, uh, you know, if I've got the CSS, I'm pretty much going to know what the HTML looks like. So, you know, being able to componentize and isolate what the HTML looks like. Uh, and as a result of that, you know, I can take this piece of code and I can take the very specific CSS for that, load it up in a browser, and see what that looks like in a very isolated case, which is different than how I used to have to do a lot of my testing, which was load up the entire web page and see if anything broke. And of course, in a project with hundreds of pages, you got to check hundreds of pages to see if anything broke. Uh, and that's just not a, a great way to build interfaces. Now, we are starting to get a lot of tooling in place to help make that easier, uh, where they can do visual regression testing, where basically you take a bunch of screenshots of your entire application, so when you make a CSS change, you generate a bunch more screenshots and compare them. Uh, but that's actually quite difficult for a lot of uh, interfaces that we build, where a single screen could actually exist in hundreds of different states, depending on what the elements are on the page, whether it's the first item, the last item, uh, the fifth item, you know, all these sort of different things. Is it archived? Is it um, need attention? All these different uh, things that can go into an interface can often make that kind of visual regression testing really difficult to do. Whereas, you know, if we can take those pieces uh, 
Uh, and if we look at you know, what actually is a component, well, you know, we've got the HTML uh, and the CSS. Uh, and so that HTML is generated from a template. Uh, and we can bring in, let's say, mock data. We can test a number of scenarios with mock data. Uh, we can bring in localization strings. What does this look like in English, French, Spanish, Greek, Russian, uh, Arabic? You know, all these different interfaces um, that we can bring in all this test data and see what it looks like. And again, we can still do this on a per component basis. I can test all the states and all the variations of that. And it's been really interesting to see, again, over the last three years, where we have things like JavaScript frameworks that uh, are now sort of codifying this stuff in the actual framework uh, with React and uh, you know, the ability to just say, okay, well, I've got this component. Let's say a video component. Uh, I can set some variables. And on the other side of this, that we have a template, uh, this sort of component declaration that can then spit out a compiled HTML, right? Again, this componentization of saying, okay, this is what our video element looks like. I'm gonna encapsulate that in a video component and then reuse that component wherever I need to. And it essentially maps that component to a given structure. And we can attach state to specific parts of this very isolated part of the interface. And we're actually seeing web browsers now implement this kind of technology through web components. Now, if you look at a web component, the, the parts of that where you have this CSS that is applied only to that component, this template that is applied only to that component, uh, and then we can tie these things together in isolation and reuse them over and over again. Um, uh, you know, this isolation of components. Okay, maybe I got it a little too far off track. Um, so, you know, how do we, once we get all these elements on a page, uh, you know, that we want to bring this stuff together, right? That we, we need these things to play well together. And there is a number of ways that we can approach this. Um, there was a, a really interesting article uh, by Hayden, I'm trying to remember, Hayden Works, I think is his Twitter handle, Hayden Pickering, I believe is his real name, uh, talking about the owl selector. Um, and the owl selector uh, essentially allows you to say, when I have an element beside an element, do this, right? Like if I have two buttons beside each other, chances are I want some spacing between those. If I have, let's say, a card-based UI, if I have two cards next to each other, uh, I want them to have a certain amount of spacing between them. Uh, but, you know, so when we use an owl selector, um, unfortunately, you know, these types of things, you know, we don't want to pollute the global namespace uh, like that. We, not everything beside everything is always going to have a certain amount of padding. Uh, so we want to isolate this stuff down to a very specific thing. Like if I have a button, what happens when I have two buttons together? What happens when I have two cards together or two inputs? You know, again, we're, if we're trying to keep things isolated, if I'm trying to write this button CSS, oh, okay, well, if I have a button next to an input, where does that CSS live? Does it live with the input or does it live with the button? Uh, and that's kind of a, a tricky situation. How do we handle that? Where do we put this stuff? Um, and I've actually been shifting my view. I've kind of been uh, strident with uh, a lot of the people that I used to work with um, who happen to be in this audience. Um, and recognizing that sort of the layout helpers, you know, these situations where I just want to have these two elements uh, next to each other uh, and having, I mean, essentially what I'm doing is, is I'm applying this sort of inline class, right? This thing that says this, these two elements on this page in this very specific case should have a certain amount of space around it. Um, and here is how I'm going to solve that problem. Uh, so, you know, I might call it layout spacer. Um, or I might come up with sort of a cryptic thing like M5, M10, MI6, if you're into uh, James Bond. Uh, that, you know, I've got these small little utility classes that I can really uh, kind of use in a bunch of different places. Now, here's another thing. Uh, media queries. Um, you know, as much as I love this sort of modular approach, uh, media queries and sort of the responsive uh, approach to web design, which is a fantastic way of developing uh, 
has some of its limitations in the fact that a media query is based on the entire page, right? Like I can't say this particular module should do something when it runs out of space. What I have to do is say, well, when this module, when I know it's gonna be inside of this other module, inside of a layout, inside of this entire page, should do something when the entire page shrinks. Um, and that can be a really tricky situation because you know we have these different things that we need to work well together uh, and it's hard to create these very specific rules to one specific thing. Um, so you know, if I have that module A and module B in layout C, then what do I do? Um, you know, because in reality, what I want to be able to say is, is that if I have this much room, I want to do this, right, to this specific module. Now, the answer to that for me is element queries. Uh, element queries are awesome. If only they existed. Damn it. Uh, so the problem right now is that element queries only exist in JavaScript. They're like prototypes right now where we have a conceptual idea of how to approach things. Um, and as a result of element queries being JavaScript based, those declarations exist in JavaScript uh, or you might want to put them in the HTML, but you can't really declare them in CSS, at least not in a really easy way. Um, and so again, the stuff that you're writing isn't where you want it. So this is still one of those sort of things that we need to happen. Uh, thankfully, there are some smart people that are thinking about this. Hopefully, we can get this in browsers in two, three, five, ten years, maybe. Uh, fun times. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read this out because it might be a little hard to see. Uh, so I, I love XKCD. Um, Keep in mind that I'm self-taught, so my code may be a little messy, and he you know, calls over his friend. She comes over. Uh, so let me see. I'm sure it's fine. Oh, wow. Uh, this is like being in a house built by a child using nothing but a hatchet and a picture of a house. Oh, man. It's like a salad recipe written by a corporate lawyer using a phone autocorrect that only knew Excel formulas. It's like someone took a transcript of a couple arguing at Ikea and made random edits until it compiled without errors. Okay, I'll read a style guide. Did anybody see that video of the guy that like went into Ikea with his girlfriend? And <laughs> Awesome. Now, of course, every XKCD comic, you have to read the alt text. Um, I honestly didn't think you could even use emoji and variable names or that there were so many different crying ones. Uh, and it's true. That works. You can actually write that code uh, if you wanted to. Uh, so sad. So obviously the point of that, you know, style guides is, you know, create standards uh, for the, the code that you write. Uh, for a lot of back-end developers, uh, and I think, you know, obviously within the last few years, a lot of JavaScript developers understand coding styles, you know, having a, an approach to this. Uh, and the thing is, is that I have seen time and time again when I worked at Yahoo, uh, when I first started at Shopify as well, uh, the every little bit of code was code reviewed except the CSS. And it was kind of this weird thing. It was like nobody really kind of cared about it. It was like, who cares? It's just CSS. And yet, you know, you run into these projects that balloon in size and are really difficult to maintain, and people wonder why. Um, and so uh, if you take nothing away from today, uh, hopefully just this one thing, uh, have code reviews within your team, even for CSS. You know, solidify the way you're coding and be consistent uh, within your team. That's very important. Uh, so I really enjoyed, you know, at, at Shopify, having a team of people that were super passionate about doing front-end development and getting a lot of those coding standards uh, in place. If you're looking for a great resource, check out styleguides.io. Uh, fantastic resource. There's also a podcast uh, that uh, Anna Debenham and Brad Frost uh, have been doing together, uh, so you can listen to those. And so there's links to uh, style guide generators. There's links to specific style guides. Um, so a, a ton of fantastic resources. Um, another one kind of related to that, Pattern Lab. Uh, Pattern Lab is probably the closest tool that I've seen to the stuff that I used to have at Yahoo uh, where we had built our own sort of prototyping engine uh, because it lets you take a look at, you know, create these individual components and actually preview what those individual components look like and then preview them in larger and larger contexts to the point where you're looking at the entire page. 
Uh, so that's a really fantastic tool, not only from a prototyping perspective, but also from a development perspective. Uh, and at Shopify, we did end up building our own style guide, which probably looks nothing like this because I don't work there anymore. Um, and, you know, and obviously the whole point of this is that we want to avoid this jumble of code, you know, this jumble of design patterns where everything is special and, and that, uh, you know, every designer is like, I, I need this page to look this way, when in reality this page is one of a hundred or a thousand uh, and that the system needs to work well together. Now, you know, when you create these patterns, it should create a conversation around what exceptions should exist. Um, and also, obviously, create a conversation about what components should or should not exist. Uh, I've often seen style guides used as a blocker for designers, um, and it should never be that way. Um, that when you create this design pattern, one, it should make the jobs easier for designers, and I have seen that uh, in a lot of teams, which is fantastic. I've seen teams take up a style guide, uh, take up this component library, and suddenly build out entire interfaces and go, wow, that made my life so much easier because I had all the tools at my disposal. That was a really useful thing uh, for me to use. Uh, and if a designer comes in and says, you know what, this particular tool set is not helping me solve this particular problem, then that's a point of conversation. That's a point where your entire team, from designers to front-end developers to back-end developers, can come together and have that conversation about what should and should not exist. Because again, every piece that is designed ends up in code. Uh, and so the more design, the more special snowflakes, the bigger your code base, the more difficult it's going to be to maintain. So, you know, when I say the future is in pieces, that we're moving towards uh, these composable UIs, that I am breaking down an interface into these individual pieces and then being able to create a UI from bringing all these pieces back together. Uh, and to be able to do that, we need to ensure that our modules are self-contained. If there's a lot of dependencies, uh, then it's difficult to know how to just pull a module in. It's like, well, I can pull this piece in, but I need to throw all these other things into the recipe as well in order for things to work the way they're supposed to. Uh, and that's not fantastic. Now, thankfully, frameworks like React are making this easier, uh, you know, that they're uh, creating a sort of boundaries around what a component is uh, and, you know, creating more structure to how we design and develop. So I think that's uh, hugely useful. Uh, and, of course, communicate. You know, this is an opportunity for everybody on your team to be involved in the process. You don't want one team to be isolated from another because uh, that just creates a lot of animosity. So on that, mission accomplished. Thank you very much. Sure. And we have five minutes, so if anybody has any questions uh, before we go, I know there's beer coming, but I'll, I'll still take a question or two. Sorry, you said there's beer coming? Uh, <laughs> When I say coming, I mean you have to go to the beer. It's like it's across the street. Sure. So the question, in case not everybody could hear it, and also because I think this is being taped, I thought, uh, the, uh, you know, what happens when you have two teams that have two different coding standards? You know, like you've got one person, one, one team doing, let's say, sort of bootstrap and uh, just augmenting some styles on top of that, and another team is doing something different. Uh, and so, again, that's that opportunity for conversation, right? Uh, you need to have some uh, consistency with those teams. I remember at, at Shopify, you know, I mentioned I'm not a big fan of the BEM naming convention. Uh, but sure enough, one team went off with the BEM naming convention, and the rest of us were like, well, you know, I guess we should probably be in line. So as, as much as I personally wasn't a fan of it, I knew that we needed to be consistent in our coding approach uh, and having... Uh, those things lined up. Now, uh, actually, the company that I work for now, uh, Zero, uh, they, their tech stack, kind of similar. They actually have situations where one team did bootstrap, uh, 
uh, and just augmented styles on that. Um, some other stuff is just hand-rolled CSS. Uh, they have one CSS file that's 16,000 lines long. Uh, just crazy stuff. And so uh, they have a team uh, in place. They have what they call a working group inside the company that uh, is there and they're to create the sort of established pattern and documentation and saying this is the direction that the company is going towards so that uh, every team can now establish that consistency moving forward. So in, instead of everybody reinventing the wheel every time, that if you have that opportunity for one team to solve a problem, then why, why not just be able to reuse that pattern for somebody else, right? Like if everybody is doing their own thing, then you can't reuse anything. Uh, and that's a, a really poor situation to be in. And I, again, I see that time and time again, where different teams, especially working on, a, on the same product, end up solving the same pattern, the same design problem, over and over and over again. Uh, one of the first projects I worked on at Yahoo, uh, when we were building the app, uh, we did an autocomplete widget. Uh, so the prototyping team that I worked on, we built the prototype. Uh, and we said, like, here's your autocomplete. You type here. There's a little uh, drop down that appears, and you can select your thing, and it's keyboard accessible. And uh, the engineering team for Yahoo Mail said, oh, that looks fantastic. Thanks. And, uh, and then two weeks later came back and said, hey, look, we built an autocomplete widget based on your prototype. I was like, oh, okay, cool. I mean, I, we already built it, but sure, you, you redid it. That's cool. Uh, and, and then uh, about two weeks later after that, the messenger team uh, because they were building stuff based on our prototypes. And they said, hey, look, we got an autocomplete widget. And it was kind of, wait a sec. We've we just now rebuilt the same thing three times. Uh, let's have some conversations so we don't repeat this stuff. Let's have uh, a common library where all these components live uh, so we don't have to repeat the effort. Uh, because at the same, you know, even though these were separate products, they were still meant to look and feel the same way. Uh, and, and zero is very much the same way. So, you know, solidifying on uh, a tech stack, not just from a CSS perspective, but I, I believe from uh, a component perspective. Like, if everybody is using Bootstrap, then everybody uses Bootstrap. Not have like one person use Bootstrap, one person use Foundation, somebody use something else. And even going as far, I would say, like, if you're using JavaScript frameworks, if everybody's using jQuery, everybody uses jQuery. Uh, if everybody's using React, everybody uses React, so that you can get that reuse uh, and use those components over and over again. Okay, I think we got time for one more question. I got one at the back. So, you know, if you've got a legacy project, uh, similar to what happened uh, at, at Shopify and similar to some of the stuff that we're running into at Zero, you know, what do we do? Uh, you know, where do we start? We got to start somewhere, right? Um, and uh, uh, every journey starts with, you know, the first step. Uh, so th the first thing I did at Shopify was I picked buttons. A button seemed like it was a small, simple thing, and I just had to refactor all the code anywhere there was a button. Uh, to isolate that thing. So I took that huge style sheet, went through, found all the button declarations, went through the entire interface, and I created a button CSS. And then I just imported that into the big file, and I just started there. And I just slowly worked my way uh, until, one, the team got bigger, and there were more people working on it, and more people able to break out this entire style sheet into smaller and smaller chunks until we had this modular system. Uh, and that's, it's gonna be a time consuming process. It's gonna be slow. Um, like I said, it's, in a lot of ways, it's somewhat ideal to be able to uh, start from scratch, but we can't always do that. Um, so you just gotta start somewhere. Pick one piece uh, and then keep chipping it away until you get it done. So on that note, thank you very much and uh, enjoy your evening.